Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Neck Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Really important topic today that you see in the news almost weekly is concussions, especially concussions in children, adolescents, and teens. Do they really po pose a problem? And I would say an absolute yes. Uh, we all know concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury where the person hits their head, whether it's a football smashing the person in the head, another player, soccer, where you have the heads collide, car accidents, falls. Uh, how many times have you and I hit our head on a cabinet? Um, over the years, I just have a lot, a lot of experience with various kind of traumatic brain injuries, which I'll discuss and why some people develop symptoms a year later, two years later, five years later. And the main point of this video is the problem is in the neck, it's not in the brain. There's so many symptoms that can be associated with concussion, being dazed to memory problems, personality changes, unconsciousness, nausea, dizziness, the host of things that I talk about often on this channel, such as vertigo, tinnitus, clicking, cracking uh, in the neck. And I'll say over and over again, the symptoms of post-concussion syndrome are likely to be from the neck, not the brain. Concussion is a type of mild traumatic brain injury. There's external forces onto the head. It usually has an acceleration, deacceleration type injury and let's be honest every time there's a force to the head what happens to the head is usually a quick rotational force and it's my proposal or my belief that it's that quick hyper rotation that actually injures the ligaments in the neck especially the upper neck and that leads to upper cervical instability which leads to changes in the 3d anatomy of the atlas. The atlas goes forward, other vertebrae can also go forward, and that can block the jugular vein. Once the jugular veins are blocked, then you're going to get an increase in toxic accumulation or pollution of the fluid in the brain, and it's this polluted fluid in the brain that I believe causes the changes in cognition, the changes in personality, the dizziness, the brain fog that occurs long-term after a concussion. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much into chronic traumatic encephalopathy, but that's what gets a lot of press, like the NFL players years later, people like uh, Jim McMahon, Terry Bradshaw, they're uh, having maybe some symptoms and they're concerned that they might end up with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy is just another term for neurodegeneration or death of neuron cells in the brain. And there's characteristics of that, but it's my belief that it's not the concussions themselves causing a brain injury, it's the concussion that they received caused neck injury and it's that chronic neck injury that's actually easily treated that can in my opinion stop the progression and hopefully reverse neurodegeneration or abnormalities that are occurring in the brain so in other words if there's a neck injury that goes undiagnosed and that neck injury is causing the fluid flow into and out of the brain to be inhibited one can easily imagine that toxins, pollutants can't get out of the brain and over time those pollutants, and there's lots of scientific studies that show there are toxic accumulation of various things in the brain, tau protein and other things that are associated with neurodegeneration. Well, it's my belief that if you open up the jugular veins by correcting the cervical curve by doing prolotherapy and obviously exercises to strengthen the soft tissues that stabilize the vertebrae 
that, that would ultimately cause the jugular veins to be open, the brain can drain, the brain can flush, and thus the pollutants or toxins exit the brain, and thus the person can recover. Yeah, the main point of this talk is that lingering symptoms are from the neck and not the brain. And you know, whenever you hear about concussion, the discussion is always about the brain, the brain, the brain, the brain. Well, again, if you have an undiagnosed upper cervical ligament injury, you have ligamentous cervical instability, that can lead to intracranial hypertension because the jugular veins can't open, the jugular veins are closed, and that is easily diagnosed by ultrasound or CT venogram. And once the cervical curve is corrected and stabilized, the symptomatology of post-concussion syndrome and thus the long-term sequelae of post-concussion syndrome at least potentially can be stopped. This slide talks about all the various traumas that can cause traumatic brain injury, concussion. Now we have all kinds of sports available to the youth. Kids are always going to have head traumas. I mean, it, it is going to happen. It's just a matter of why does it seem like now when they get a head trauma, it's like hyper alert where when I was a kid, it just wasn't a big deal. Like what's the difference in why do a collision in the youth today seem to take on increased importance compared to when I uh, was a youth. And I'm going to talk about that later in this talk. These are all the common symptoms that occur with concussion, uh, headache, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, seeing stars, dizziness, drowsiness, fatigue. Um, and I would just say that, especially to parents, it's like, it's so common that there's some kind of a trauma, the kid goes on, you know, post-concussion protocol, right? I'm sure a lot of parents out there know about the post-concussion protocol. And mostly the symptoms that they're looking for is like, is the young person more fatigued or the person after a car accident more fatigued? Do they have brain fog? Are their personality changes, you know, are they kind of depressed and lethargic? But I would say even more important than that is, do you have neck pain after the concussion? You know, is there tightness? Is there neck pain? Neck pain is a signal or a sign that there is undiagnosed neck injury that needs to be addressed. And this neck injury, it can be delayed four months, six months, eight months, meaning that a person can have a trauma to the head, to the neck, and then have a window period where they're asymptomatic. You know, in other words, the body will accommodate, the spinal curve will change, the spinal curve will change. There might be just a little bit of muscle tightness, but it's almost imperceivable, but there's underlying ligament damage, and as the child or the person gets back to activities four months later, six months later, then all of a sudden there's all kinds of cracking, clicking, popping in the neck, and that's a sign that the person does have ligamentous cervical instability that needs to be treated. You know, and this is just basically all head collisions, head traumas, they do also cause a whiplash type injury in the neck. Whenever you have a head trauma, even if you knock your head into a cabinet door that's open that you didn't know was open, you hit your head, then there's always a twist. And it's that twist that can injure the ligaments, especially in the upper neck. And if that goes undiagnosed, it's a progressive disorder, much like a loose screw on a hinge, right? You open and close the cabinet door. There's a little bit of jingling. The one screw is loose, but if you keep opening and closing the door, the next screw gets loose. Once that hinge is loose, the next hinge gets loose. So a loose screw on a door hinge is a progressive disorder unless you get a screwdriver, just like a simple ligament injury, if we can call it simple, if it goes untreated, it's going to be progressive because if the C1, C2 is loose, eventually the C2, C3 segment will get loose, C4, C5. And again, 
ligament injuries in the neck are easily diagnosed with upright motion x-ray or videography. So we, we utilize digital motion x-ray. And this is how concussion is normally explained that you hit your head on something, the frontal lobe is hit, and then as you go back, the brain hits the back of the skull. So there's actually two injuries to the brain. I'm not denying that can't cause brain injury, my residency training was at Heinz VA Medical Center and we had a lot of traumatic brain injury patients there. And I've seen severe, severe traumatic brain injury, which is very serious. I was medical director after I got out of residency at an assisted living traumatic brain injury center where after the initial rehab, the people would go there to try to see if they were safe to live you know, to, to, to do daily activities on their own uh, before they went home. Uh, so s traumatic brain injury is very, very serious. When we talk about concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, we're just saying that a person has some dizziness, had a head trauma, maybe has a headache, you know, and then as we all know, two-thirds of the people within you know a few months usually get resolution of the symptoms but that doesn't mean that an unresolved neck injury isn't there and it's this unresolved neck injury that leads to the polluted brain uh, the toxic brain because the fluid flow into and out of the brain is inhibited and again, this just explains the various symptoms of concussion, especially head pressure, dizziness, ringing in the ears. You can get slurred speech, and basically there's an injury in the front, injury in the back of the brain. Now this is from our study, so I'd really recommend people uh, get this scientific paper. Danielle and I wrote with Barb and Sarah Sawyer, chronic neck pain making the connection between ligament capsular or ligament laxity and cervical instability. It's in the Open Orthopedic Journal. We published it in 2014. In there is a graph to show how similar atlantoaxial instability, that's what I'm talking about, C1, C2 instability. The symptoms are almost identical to whiplash associated disorder, cervical cranial syndrome, and post-concussion disorder, and has some similarities of vertebral basilar insufficiency. The thing about neck injury is neck injuries can easily be treated. So imagine a person has a car accident or adolescent, they hit their head with another player playing soccer, and then, you know, five years later, they have all these brain symptoms. You know, they're depressed, they're lethargic, they're anxious, uh, their personality is changing, they have ADD you know, all these symptoms, when it was easily treated, if it was diagnosed early that the problem is in the neck, not in the brain. This was from a, a plumbing contractor patient of mine, so he sent me this. A clogged regular toilet is no laughing matter, neither is a clogged brain toilet. Now this was after Hurricane Ian, this is our pool. Now would you swim in that pool? Absolutely, you wouldn't swim in that pool because it's all polluted. Cerebral spinal fluid is supposed to be very clear, just like a pool. So imagine if a person has obstruction of the jugular veins and 70% of the fluid in the brain is in the venous system. So imagine if the fluid can't freely get out of the brain during sleep. That's when most of the detoxification or cleaning or flushing of the brain occurs during sleep. So if you've had a concussion or know somebody's had a concussion and they do not wake up refreshed, you know, like, like sleeping or laying down doesn't make, make any difference and I'd recommend that you get evaluated for a neck injury and we'll talk about what tests are needed for that. And this is just uh, from a slide from a scientific paper that explains all the pollutants that accumulate in the human brain that cause neurodegeneration or death of brain cells, including all kinds of inflammatory neurotransmitters, tau protein, 
and much of the scientific research is on how to decrease these but again if the problem is an obstructed brain toilet where the brain's all polluted because of these substances but the cause of it is that the fluid can't freely get out of the brain and the brain can't flush itself or clean itself regularly during sleep we all know a power nap why do you think a power nap you wake up and you're all refreshed well basically the brain flushes the brain flushes the brain pressure goes down because of course if the fluid isn't freely flowing out of the brain the brain pressure is going to go up and then you take a power nap for 20 minutes and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Your brain pressure goes down, the toxins, the pollutants get out of the brain. Then of course the, uh, the, the brain can start to repair itself, regenerate itself. I like this. This is basically our backyard now. Around our house on Sanibel Island, we live on Sanibel Island, so uh, from Hurricane Ian, if you look at, if you came to Sanibel now, and I'm making this video five months after the hurricane, uh, almost the only trees on the whole island now are palm trees, you know, because palm trees are bendable. Palm trees are bendable. We had, uh, our neighbor had this 100 foot Australian pine and that thing, boom, blocked our street after Hurricane Ian. Ian. So is a pine tree, is a, a is a really big tree isn't it stronger than a palm tree and you'd have to say yes like the trunks can be bigger uh, but a palm tree is bendable so the palm tree can handle a lot more force than these really big other trees and when somebody has a lordotic curve, so here's a lordotic curve. So we had a patient come in, then we corrected their curve. They were feeling fantastic. Then they got into an accident and that's the curve reverted back to how they had originally come in. A straight curve or a reversal of the neck curve called cervical kyphosis, that cannot handle a lot of force. A lordotic curve and normal spinal curves, much like a palm tree, can handle unbelievable forces. Now we know these palm trees look sick, right? It's after Hurricane Ian. But you would look this way too if you were subjected to 150 mile an hour winds for four to five hours. So the reason that a cervical curve is so important, especially in young people, if they're playing sports, if they get a head trauma, the, the head and the neck can handle so much force. But if a child has been looking down at a cell phone or a tablet or school age kids or preteens or high school kids, they're like this all day or they're like playing their games on the computer and they have lost the cervical curve, then they have a head trauma. Well, that neck, because it doesn't have the lordotic curve, it can't handle the force. There's a patient that came in recently, and this will take, this will make the point. Honor student, high school honor student, she's in gym class, a person throws a basketball at her, she misses it, boom, it hits her in the face, then six months later, she's reading at a third grade level when she was an honor student. So why is it nowadays a kid has one, which seems like an innocuous kind of, you know, a basketball one time, you know, causes a minor whiplash. Why is it now that it has such devastating effects? And I think it's the kids nowadays, they just don't have a cervical curve because they're all looking down. You know, so basically, you, it's important to have a cervical curve, a cervical or not a curve. That curve can handle a lot of force. These kind of curves cannot. So if you have a car accident, whiplash injury, you hit your head on a cabinet door, you're playing sports, you know, there's some kind of a collision and you're starting with this kind of a curve. This kind of a curve is not bendable, much like the big trees, apparently strong trees on Sanibel Island. Then the wind comes and boom, 
they just go down. So you get hit by a ball, you get knocked in the head, you know, you're MMA fighting, you get punched, boom. You know, then all of a sudden you have post-concussion syndrome and all kinds of terrible symptoms uh, and your personality changes, feel depressed. This is how the jugular vein is supposed to look. So you can see when we do ultrasound, this is a normal carotid sheath, vagus nerve, carotid artery, jugular vein. Imagine if a person lays down and the jugular vein is supposed to be like this, but it's like this. Well, the cross-sectional area is decreased by 75%. So the, the brain's trying to clean itself. It's trying to get rid of all the toxins, but it can't because the jugular vein is compressed. So the toxins just stay in there, tau protein, inflammatory neurotransmitters. And what basically happens is the people get progressive cognitive decline. We have 20 year olds who say to me and my staff, it feels like I'm getting Alzheimer's disease and they basically are. Their brain is under such an assault that the, the, there probably are neurons that are starting to get destroyed. And if too many of them get destroyed, then uh, the recovery obviously is gonna take a lot longer than if somebody was to come in sooner or the person was to uh, earlier rather than later get an evaluation for cervical instability and then if there's a reversal of the curve or there's evidence of ligament damage in the neck, then of course uh, get that treated with curve correction and prolotherapy. This just shows, I mean, we just did this with a balloon, but the balloon was relaxed at nine inches. So there was a certain, there was, there was markings on the balloon, cervical curve. So then I straightened the model and the balloon was stretched 11 inches. And you can see right here where it's getting kinked. When a person has a normal cervical lordotic curve, everything in the neck is in its shortened position. So the spinal cord is relaxed, jugular veins relaxed, vagus nerves relaxed, carotid arteries relaxed. Once everything's lengthened, basically this is an extension. This is basically a posture of flexion. So everything's stretched out. This just shows the balloon stretched out by two inches. The jugular vein doesn't have any muscular walls. So if you, basically you could go like this, like you barely touch like this and on ultrasound, the jugular vein would be compressed. So you can imagine if it's always under stretch, then the normal large conduits by which fluid drains the brain, especially when laying down are closed off. The brain, see, or the brain seeks out other pathways to get the fluid flow to come out. So it will use the lymphatic system. So if you've been told that you have enlarged lymph nodes, well, just realize it could be that you have blocked jugular veins and the lymph nodes are enlarging because fluid now is passing in those lymph nodes. Then the other passageway that's common when your jugular veins are compressed is the emissary veins and the vertebral veins in the back. So these we can pick up on cone beam CT scan where these are supposed to be very little, but when you have the jugular veins being compressed, you know, they enlarge, but the net result is still gonna be intracranial hypertension. And intracranial hypertension, I believe, is the silent killer of the brain. So if you have cognitive uh, problems after a concussion, um, brain fog, brain fatigue, and it doesn't seem to resolve, I can't encourage you enough to make sure that you get evaluated for a cervical neck injury. I'm gonna show a couple slides that go through some of the research, but basically even one concussion caught, can cause, and, sh and in studies over time, even one concussion has been shown to cause significant cognitive decline, and each concussion builds on it. So I'll just read some of this. People with even one concussion compared with those without a head injury had significantly poorer attention, executive scores, and processing speed. These deficits increase with each concussion. Those with concussions up to four had poorer attention, processing speed, and working memory compared with those reporting no concussion. 
Even one concussion caused significant cognitive impairment at one year compared to people who did not have an injury. So again, what I think happens is in people who don't have any sequelae after a concussion, I think the reason is they didn't have a significant ligament injury in the neck or they healed it very quickly. And people who at one year still have lingering symptoms and they have long-term sequelae like chronic traumatic encephalopathy or they years later get diagnosed with you know, dementia, it, I believe the problem is that the brain hasn't been draining that whole time. Like the brain was draining fine before the concussion, before the, the trauma to the head. They sustained, unbeknownst to them, they sustained a ligament injury in the neck. That caused a breakdown of the neck curve, which I call cervical destructure. The neck curve straightens or reverses. That ultimately leads to a fluid flow issue into and out of the brain. And because it went undiagnosed, toxins and pollutants accumulated in the brain and those toxins, as, along with the increased intracranial pressure, caused brain cells to die. Then long term what happens is the brain volume, the actual amount of brain tissue starts decreasing. And when it's symmetric and diffuse, we call that Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Now this is the same thing with adolescent kids. So I'll just read some of this. So this was in 5,616 high school kids. They did these very sophisticated cognitive tests over time. And I think they had something like 800 to 1,000 kids who had had a concussion or multiple concussion. Then they had like 4,000 plus kids who didn't have any concussion. And they showed that even one concussion was associated with lower global cognitive scores and lower scores in all cognitive domains. Each subsequent concussion lowered global cognitive Cognition even more and lower scores on verbal memory, visual memory, and impulse control. And it was even worse with females. And anybody knows, I've said this several times on various videos, when there's a condition that's worse in females than males, like what's structurally the difference between males and females, in general it is that females are looser jointed than males. Like you go to any teenage girl, it's unbelievable like how loose their joints are, many of them compared to the guys, right? Guys have you know, more muscle mass and women are more loose jointed. So this is one of the signs that it's, this whole thing is probably a ligamentous issue. So you young people may not even know dodgeball except from the movie which with Vince Vaughn and Ben Stiller, which was a funny movie, but that's what it was. Like we would do it in gym class. So you were actually trying to hit another kid in the, basically, you're not supposed to hit in the head, but you know, kids would always get hit in the head and it just seemed like it wasn't a big deal. You know, and I'm not saying that head traumas back in the 1970s weren't a big deal, but I think the reason why it's such a big issue now, isn't that one dodgeball thing to the head is so dangerous, it's that the neck curves today, they can't handle that force. So thus, the, a ball striking a head today in a young person is just so much more dangerous than, than it used to be. So my main point isn't that I want dodgeball to be going into all the school districts again, but basically when you lose the neck curve, the neck gets weak. So what people need to do is strengthen their necks, strengthen their necks. And then and we'll I'll show some video I'll show some figures about, you know, proper neck positioning like with the computer. But we're very naive to say that this is okay to have all of our kids continuously looking down at a tablet, and looking down at a cell phone. It is so dangerous for them because when they do play sports, they can't handle the forces on the head. And I don't care what sport it is, you're going to get some head traumas.
we can do certain things so there's less collisions, but there's going to be collisions. So the treatment needs to be preventative, which is that the kids have a normal neck curve. And the way you figure out you have a normal neck curve is just get a neck x-ray. So the kids need to be looking up. So and, and that's the most important point. You Kids need to be looking up. So a parent could put something on a television but have the, pers the child looking up. So these types of curves, curves again, are not good. Any, this is a lordotic curve. So lordotic curve, straight curve, S curve. So you need to have a lordotic curve. The lordotic curve can handle amazing amount of force. There's lots and lots of research to show that people with concussions or whiplash injury, they have all kinds of abnormalities in their neck proprioceptors. The, uh, reflexes that keep your gaze stable. These show that there's some type of neck injury that's leading to the various symptomatology of post-concussion syndrome. This is a paper on what are the symptoms caused by cervical instability and basically you'll see that this is the same as post-concussion syndrome. It's basically identical. So I believe that the majority of people that suffer with symptomatology after a concussion, after a mild brain injury, it's from an undiagnosed ligamentous cervical injury that can be treated by curve correction, sometimes with chiropractic adjustments such as upper cervical, very gentle adjustments, and prolotherapy. This is an interesting graph entitled Cognitive Decline Associated with Increasing Age and Increasing Brain Pressure. These are the references. We all know as we age, especially after the age of 60, there can be cognitive decline. And also what people may not be aware of is that as brain pressure increases, normal brain pressure is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Once it gets beyond 20, you can ha start having significant cognitive decline by the, when it increases over 40 there can even be brain death. So when we talk about severe, severe traumatic brain injuries, we're talking about brain pressures over in here. When we're talking about mild traumatic brain injury, we're talking about brain pressures in here. So how does the brain pressure go from here to here to where somebody gets chronic traumatic encephalopathy or many years after playing college sports or whatever, they end up having significant mental decline. My belief is that the increasing brain pressure over time is because ligamentous cervical instability is a progressive disorder. You get obstruction of the jugular veins, which leads to increased intracranial pressure. We do various diagnostic non-invasive tests in the office for intracranial hypertension, including optic nerve sheath diameter, transcranial Doppler where we can look at the arterial flow in the brain and obviously the diameter of the jugular veins. Even normal MRIs can show evidence of high brain pressure. You can see right here there's a torturous optic nerve. That's a sign of increased intracranial pressure. There's flattening of the globe of the eye. There's all this white is an excessive amount of CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. So that's a sign of intracranial hypertension. Then if you think about it, if there's a block of the jugular veins here, probably the first thing that's gonna happen is there's gonna be a block of the cerebral spinal fluid because the cerebral spinal fluid can't get out of the brain. And if you, you look at the research on intracranial hypertension, there's all kinds of various mental disorders, psychological disorders, change in brain function, uh, depression, anxiety, bipolar, ADD, higher incidence of brain fog. To me, the most logical cause of post-concussion symptoms is injury to the neck where the sinuses, venous sinuses in the brain, they can't drain. The brain drains 
by fluid going into these sinuses, the inferior sagittal sinus, superior sagittal straight sinus, and other sinuses, which ultimately drain into the internal jugular vein. When the internal jugular vein gets blocked, you basically get fluid accumulation and toxin accumulation in the cerebral spinal fluid. Different parts of the brain get affected predominantly, and it definitely affects the frontal lobe, which of course has to do with problem solving, higher level cognitive functioning. It also affects the brain stem. There can be flattening of the pons here, and that's the relay center, and that can cause a host of symptoms that can affect breathing. It can affect the autonomic nervous system because the autonomic nervous system's here. So if you feel like you're dying or your heart is racing uh, intermittently and you believe that you have autonomic dysfunction, sympathetic hyperactivity, like the adrenaline system is on hyper alert, it's likely that you have intracranial hypertension. Uh, I've even had cases where there's atrophy of different parts of the brain, including the cerebellum, uh, from uh, obstruction of the jugular vein. And then basically the whole brain gets polluted. So again, would you jump into a pool after Hurricane Ian that looks all brown? You wouldn't. So what's going to happen to the human brain if it's swimming in a bunch of toxins and pollutants? So we have Hurricane Ian, that's where our house was. This is at 1030. I was actually in our house with my wife, my nephew, Alex, and his wife, Michaela. And you could see the <laughs> eye wall, the eye wall here. So we were getting annihilated. There's the pool underwater. Then we cleaned the pool, put in some pool pumps, and that was yesterday. So that was the first time that human beings were in our pool. That's Michaela and Marion excited to use the pool again because there's now the free flow of water and the water can be filtered. So can your brain be filtered after a concussion? You know, so people who don't have residual problems after a concussion, probably the fluid flow into and out of the brain is not inhibited. Those who have symptoms that linger, it's likely that the fluid flow into and out of the brain is inhibited. So to use a plunger on the brain toilet, like how do you unclog the brain? Well, you correct the cervical or dotted curve. You figure out what sleep position. This is the, some of the diagnostic testing we do in the office here where we check the jugular vein diameters with different sleep positions. So you sleep in a position where the neck's extended and we can figure out the right side, left side. So we're trying to maximize the diameter of the jugular vein. So figuring out what sleep position is best so the brain drains good. And then we look at optimizing the computer setup. So this is basically, you know, my computer setup. So I have a kneeling rocker bottom chair. You can see that I'm looking up. You know, and again, I can adjust the height. And then when I want to take a break, I just stand. But you could see how high my computer setup is. And I wish the children, the adolescents, they wouldn't be looking down so much at their cell phone because I fret for them that their cognitive decline isn't going to be in the 80s. It's going to be in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And we're definitely already seeing teenagers and young people in their 20s already concerned that their memory is going. So please work on optimizing your neck curve. There, these are prism glasses, so maybe get a pair of those so you can look at your cell phone, but your neck is in the extended position. If you want to look down at your cell phone, please get on your stomach. Then you could see that the neck's extended. There's various devices that you can buy where you can put your cell phone on it and it wraps around your neck. And of course, have the proper uh, computer height look up. So it's basically consciously doing a look up lifestyle versus a looking down lifestyle. And then if you have instability as documented by motion fluoroscopy, digital motion x-ray, or static x-rays but in different positions, 
then prolotherapy should be something that you look into. Prolotherapy is an injection technique that stimulates the body to repair ligaments. The ligaments get thicker, tighter. And then when you repeat the digital motion x-ray, there's less lighting. And this typically correlates with improvement of symptoms. Now, normally with prolotherapy, the average person for peripheral joints needs three to six visits. When we get into uh, upper cervical instability where there's neurologic symptoms that the people have, such as dizziness, vertigo, ringing of the ear, swallowing difficulty, digestive issues, uh, memory problems, you know, it can be anywhere from six to 10 visits, which ultimately it depends on how much uh, instability there is present on the initial scanning technique. I'm here with Dawson and Dawson, you know, there's certain people that I meet that literally in the room I could cry. So you were one of those folks yesterday. And you know, I've only known you for one day. So I, and you know, it's very kind of you to like tell your story, but why don't you just tell your story? Yeah, obviously, I'm very thankful to be here. and. Um, submit my case to you and talk a little bit about like my struggles for the last three years. Uh, obviously, I was a professional hockey player, um, signed an NHL contract in 2020, and then uh, all of a sudden was dealing with a, an illness um, of some sort that we uh, had no idea about really. Um, took three years of testing and ruling out so many possible uh, things with the uh, heart and stomach and uh, head and neck and um, that brought me to you it brought me here um, I obviously have a lot of work to do still but uh, yesterday we had a our first aha moment in three years um, literally uh, not scared to say I shed a couple of tears just seeing some uh, some some answers there some physical oh, answers awesome. good and good. Uh, good. yeah my mother and I are here and um, we're hoping that this can can be an answer for us now you know, obviously from your youth, your dream, like you actually had, you know, fulfilled your dream to actually finally make it into the NHL. Now, obviously as a hockey player, lots of concussions or several concussions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and neck instability is super important, obviously as a, as a professional athlete and you, know, you hear a lot in football of concussions, hockey probably is just as much, obviously as less players, but it's probably just as prominent. Um, and I think a lot of people don't, uh, realize how dangerous that is and how it can affect uh, so many other things in your body. Yeah, that's exactly right. So why don't you just go through like, like obviously a lead athlete makes it to the NHL 2020 and then some symptoms started to occur. Now you did get COVID. So mm -hmm. then that, that was like, you don't know, like, you know, like you did get COVID. Sure. So then, you know, so you're also one of those people that you might get labeled as a long haul COVID. You know, if you, maybe some doctor had told you that, and you know, my feeling has always been that if you have like vagus nerve degeneration or intracranial pressure, then you get COVID. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back. But the real issue relates to the underlying cervical uh, instability causing the vagus nerve degeneration and the intracranial hypertension. But so you like you're doing really really well. Then what were the symptoms and what was the progression of the symptoms to lead you today? Absolutely, yeah. The the first like noticeable symptom that I had was uh, tachycardia, which um, it seems crazy for an, an athlete of myself to have that, and you notice it like right away when something's not right. And I noticed it right away, and it just continued to be a burden on my life. Couldn't sleep. Things got worse, um, and then. You know, lots of testing done, and it turns to the stomach, and you start to have stomach issues. Um, it's like, you know, what are these? What are what's causing these things? You know, we've heard we hear the word vagal nerve from, uh, you know, heart doctors, but we really don't know much about it, and we really can't get into it much, and we can't. We there's not a lot of people that will dive into it too much, and they say it's very unlikely, and um, you know, then they they order their own tests, and everything's negative on their front. Well, everything just keeps leading back to the function of of the vagal nerve uh, for me and uh, and when you when you talk about it when I see these videos of these people on here it's so eye-opening uh, to see this it's, it's unbelievable. No you bring up a good point about vagus nerve degeneration 
you know, like obviously you watched the videos and there must have been at some point you thought maybe it was your neck. Like, I mean, did you have clicking, popping and grinding or did you have like neck tension or what made you think like possibly it might somewhat be related to your neck? Well, I had, I had tension um, quite a bit and like when I would have these, uh, like the tachycardia or whatever and I'd wake up in, in the middle of the night to uh, have a shooting like pain up there in, that, in those areas. Um, obviously when you're having tachycardia, it's hard to think like neck. Yeah. And so once you like reel some of those stuff out of, of uh, you move to, well, it, my neck continues to hurt. My neck continues right. to have like issues here. It feels like very uncomfortable. It's tight, yeah. numb almost. Um, and then you, you know, obviously yeah. you're lucky enough to find. Well, you know, you and I had talked about too that in traditional medicine, like let's be honest, like for the most part you were in traditional medicine. It's not to bad mouth any doctors mm -hmm. or anything. But the testing that you had done prior to you coming here, it was all with you laying down. You know, where, you know, in our office, you had a lot of testing where you were upright. And you do feel worse when you're upright, right? Versus like laying down. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it can definitely, obviously, you know, we did a lot of tests yesterday and there's, there's certain motions that feel worse when you're certain ways with your neck and stuff. Um, that can you know have bad, better better or worse blood flow and like all those yeah. sorts of things and how you sleep, um, but like as far as the severity of like the testing, like this is over and over and beyond anything that I'd ever had okay. in regular medicine for sure. And then, I'm sure it probably shocked you. Like I hadn't looked at your DMX, but like you know 20 seconds, and I'm like, you got like really severe. Why well, even called it extreme yeah. neck instability? Yeah, because yeah, it's a, it's scary, yeah. right? It's yeah. Scary to hear that. Yeah. So what did you guys talk about last night, you know, after the visit? Like, I mean, were you, because, you know, I did tell you some scary things, like you got to wear a collar and you got to do this and that. And it's like, you know, like, what was the mood? Was the mood good or the mood was bad last night? Yeah, I think we got on the phone with uh, my close family members and girlfriend and had that conversation of, we got some answers for okay. the first time. You okay. know, a doctor didn't lead me to another doctor. Uh, this is a serious issue and this could be causing and okay. is the root of all of these problems. Okay. So we felt uh, re related, uh, but, but nervous about the future and what yeah. that would hold, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, but overall, we felt uh, just relieved. Okay. Because yeah. that's what I thought you should do. Like it isn't bad news, even though the amount of ligament damage is yeah. severe to the point where I did say that we should order some sophisticated right. MRIs to just see the extent of it. Right. But it is the problem. So just knowing that there is a problem and mm -hmm. that it is fixable, obviously we're gonna to try to fix it with prolotherapy versus surgery. Yep. Because you know, most people, even surgeons, most of the surgeons would say, you know, even if you meet the criterion for a cervical fusion, even most surgeons would say, you know, fusion surgery really should be only if it's an emergency or you did exhaust all the conservative methods and then if you exhaust the conservative methods then consider surgery and i would just say that one of the conservative message or conservative therapies that you should exhaust is prolotherapy yeah 100 percent. we're willing to do everything that we can before extreme measures like that so while concussion can have various detrimental long-term effects, I hope this video gives you hope because often the problem isn't in the brain, it's in the neck. There's easy diagnostic tests that can show the instability and when present by doing curve correction and prolotherapy, the prognosis is excellent for recovery.